All right, so our second session is on anatomy, physiology, and behavior, and it's being chaired by my dear friend, Naomi Ray. Okay, um, well, welcome to this second se session, which is about genetic architecture. So I guess de genetic architecture, as we've heard this morning, can be defined as number of variants, their effect sizes, their frequency in the population, and the way they interact with each other. Um, so with the introductory talks before the panel discussion, we were tasked with providing empirical evidence for genetic architecture and traits, and then to give insights into evolutionary forces. Um, I think the panel discussion that follows were tasked with a broader set of questions building on those foundations. So in this section, we've got three speakers. We've got Sir Michelle George from the University of Liège, Neil Riche online, and um, yours truly, somebody at the last minute dropped out, and so I was tasked with to take their place. So just a little bit about myself. I've just um, relocated to the University of Oxford, where I'm in the Department of Psychiatry, but my first career was in livestock genetics. And one of the things about livestock genetics is that you have very, very intense selection. And one of the incredible things is that with that intense selection, genetic progress is happening every generation. And the only way you can explain that is by polygenicity and new variants. Um, there's so much polygenicity that that um, selection continues in each generation. And that really underpins my approach to uh, human genetics as well. And it doesn't make sense to me that the genetic architecture of livestock traits would be different to the genetic architecture of human traits. And so therefore it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce Michelle Georges, who's Professor of Genetics and Genomics at the University of Liège in Belgium. Um, he is well known in the livestock genomics community for his functional genomics work. Um, he also works on inflammatory bowel disease in humans. Um, and so I think his story about muscling in cattle is going to be very insightful. So I'm really delighted that Michelle's here today to join us. Now, I don't know how, I don't know how we advance, how do we advance the slides? Okay, so it's a, it's a real great honor and stress to be here. I, I thank the organizers, Nancy, uh, Molly, and uh, Naomi. I'm, I'm not thanking Peter. Uh, you know, I asked Peter a few weeks ago, you know, why, why am I on the program of this, uh, of this uh, incredible conference? And he said, it's Naomi's fault. So <laughs> I, I'm, thanking, I'm thanking Naomi and, uh, and, and genetic architecture of anatomy, physiology and behavior. So I sort of looked around in the lab and what I have, have done. And, and that's sort of the closest I, I could get to anatomy and physiology. So I'll tell you about, uh, it's a bit the, a connection with the beginning of my career, the, the phenotype you will see, but it's the work primarily from uh, a group in the lab, a PI called Tom Druet, who is in charge of genomic selection in this uh, breed. It's primarily the work of a, of a PhD student, Chan Yuan, but with contribution of a postdoc, José Louis Gualdron, and supervision of other uh, PIs, Carole Charrier and Aruco. So I'll tell you about this uh, beast. So it's essentially a, a cattle breed that is well known in Belgium, where it accounts for approximately half of the herd. And in fact, there has been unconsciously sort of a, a selection experiment, strong direction of selection that has been going on for approximately 60 years. So the breed was there before. It sort of was born around the 1900s. It was what we call a dual purpose breed. And in these breeds, people, observed sometimes what is called in French cul de poulain. In, in English, we call them double muscle animals, and they create problems because they generate dystocia. Uh, despite that fact, in the 60s, Belgian breeders decided that they were going to fix this qualitative uh, double muscled phenotype, and they started a selection process uh, towards uh, that goal in the largest fraction of the population that I call in the slides the population one, but they maintained, if you will, a control uh, uh, population. And this, this uh, you will see the, the corresponding gene was quite readily fixed 
And since then, which I call 1980 until now, they have continued to select for increasing muscularity, but now dealing with a quantitative uh, trait, if you want. And so I'll tell you a bit about the results, the observations we have made during this first phase of that selection experiment and the second uh, one. So the first phase of the selection experiment started with before the era of DNA markers with segregation analysis. And uh, Anse, my predecessor, if I may say so, at the University of Liège, was convinced that there was a major locus at play, although the, the uh, Naomi Reyes of the world from Edinburgh and all these places said it's impossible, major genes don't exist, it's all polygenic. But he, with segregation analysis, was essentially saying there is this locus, it's partially dominant, and uh, that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the effects distinguishing the homozygous wild types from the heterozygotes and the homozygous mutants in terms of residual standard deviations. And if you want to go and look at the actual phenotype, muscle mass is, let's say, increased by 25%, but the weight of other organs is actually reduced by a stronger uh, uh, fraction. And then to make a long story short, uh, we positionally cloned and identified the corresponding gene benefiting a lot from uh, Sejin Lee's work in the mouse. The gene is a calone, a hormone secreted by a tissue to reduce its growth, and it's called uh, myostatin. And uh, so we uh, found a mutation that disrupts that, uh, that gene that is now fixed in these uh, Belgian blues, and that is essentially the, having the effect that was predicted in the segregation analysis, and it left a strong sweep in the breed at the present time. It's a region that is entirely monomorphic. The length is not so much. It's sort of a thing that is between a heart and a soft sweep because the mutation was probably segregating in the population for a while. So at that time, people thought that this mutation was actually coming from England. And this, this phenotype had dis been described in multiple breeds. And the stories were that all these breeds were sh sharing the same identical by descent mutation. And in fact, when we looked at all the, the European breeds in which they described this double muscle phenotype, it was every time a distinct mutation. So there was a clear uh, 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 phenomenon of locus homogeneity. It was always the same gene that was coming out, but these were independently captured by selection. There was a lot of uh, allelic uh, uh, heterogeneity. And of course, that's quite remarkable because you would sort of imagine that muscular hypertrophy can appear through a variety of pathways and genes. And in fact, clearly, the fact that we always have this identical gene indicates that there are not very many ways, at least in this species, to obtain uh, that phenotype. In the majority of these breeds, because of these dystocic problems, this thing is maintained in a, 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 there's a form of balancing selection. People were not aware of the mutation but we're trying to keep an intermediate phenotype as so a uh, situation of balance, balancing selection. So uh, after that, the mutation or mutations in the same gene were observed in a series of other uh, species. But the interesting thing is that it's sort of species specific. So it seems to be a similar situation in some breeds or some species, sorry, but not in other ones. For instance, if you knock out this gene in the pig, the pig is sick uh, as, a, as a summary. I'll also briefly mention that there are uh, hypomorphic alleles that were detected, and there's a nice one in the sheep because the, the mutation creates an illegitimate target site for microRNAs, which is sort of a fun uh, story. So that's essentially the, the first phase of the selection experiment, the fixation of knockout mutations in a very specific genes, and the demonstration that there are not many pathways that can lead to uh, this double muscle phenotype. So the Belgian breeders were apparently not satisfied with the increased muscle mass due to this gene, and they continued to want to have uh, more muscled animals, as you have seen in the first slide that I showed you, and they moved in their way to something that they call quantitative. But in fact, the quantitative thing for them is they define a certain number of phenotypes, which they quantitatively measure with their eyes. So they have specialized technicians that go visit cows and they rank for 22 characters, the animals, on a range from one to 50. There's only one that is actually measured its height. And these 22 phenotypes, they cluster into stature, muscularity, and another thing which is least uh, related to ossification, I won't talk about that, 
I'll only look at stature and uh, muscularity uh, today. So you would say, my God, this can't be very heritable. Uh, and in fact, these are the uh, estimates of the heritabilities estimated on a population over the last five years. So you, you see height. So, so I've organized the phenotypes in on the left stature, on the right muscularity. The first one, height, is the only one that is measured. It has a heritability of around 40%. And the other ones have a reasonable heritability. Looks like there is a bit more on the muscularity side than on the stature side. And as expected, you know, we still have the highest estimates when we use genealogy pedigrees to estimate kinship, but we get close based on SNP-based heritability. This is with a medium density SNP array. If we go to genome-based, uh, we, we gain one or 2% more, but we're still below the, uh, the uh, uh, pedigree-based heritability. You know, say so if it's heritable, it should respond to selection. Sorry for the quality of this slide. What I'm showing here is the, in white, uh, yellow, and orange, is the phenotypic distribution in this control population sorted by the phenotype, uh, the genotype, sorry, at the myostatin locus. This control population still segregates. So you still have the three uh, genotypic classes. And the red ones is what we have now in the Belgian blue. And so it, it gives you an idea how much has been gained between 1980. So there's a substantial gain, but the gain is actually relatively limited when compared to what the myostatin mutation was doing on uh, its own. And so for, for today, essentially the question is, you know, there is, there is still heritability. Oh, and I should show you there is a response to selection. I, I sort of rediscovered these things uh, while preparing the talk here. It is, it is not spectacular. So when compared to the major effect of the myostatin mutation, there is progress, there is variation, there is heritability, but it's not uh, spectacular. And maybe we can connect that with the rest of the talk. But so the question is, of course, what is the architecture of this residual uh, heritability, if you want? And the data that I will show you has been obtained by having phenotypes for approximately 15,000 animals that includes these eyeball uh, phenotypes. And all these animals are genotyped and imputed. We have around uh, genotypes at around 20, 12 million uh, positions. And of course, to go after the architecture, Tom and his crew first did a, a GWAS using very standard uh, methods. So he used CHEMA either in univariate or in uh, multivariate way. And essentially when he looked at all the phenotypes separately, um, he identifies a certain number of, of uh, loci, but there are not that many loci, it's the same low size for the different phenotypes. And so he's doing a multivariate an, uh, analysis to try to sort of refine or uh, the, the increase the accuracy. So this is the result for musculatory and stature. And so you can sort of see that these are nearly identical patterns. And I allowed myself sort of to merge all these things in, in one. Uh, I guess for us, what it means is uh, it could of course be related to the way that these people phenotype the animals, but it suggests uh, a lot of uh, pleiotropy. And so before we sort of say pleiotropy, we convinced ourselves that not, not only the locations were the same, but that the underlying mutations, variants that drive these peaks were the same. So we would do co-localization. Essentially, it confirms it's the same mountains. I'm just showing you two examples where we sort of look at whether it's a correlation between p-values or signed uh, t-statistics, for instance. So what you see here is that the, the slope of the lower triangle can be positive or negative here, while it's always positive here. Essentially, we have some loci for which the signs of the effect on the two groups, stature and muscularity, are the same, and some other loci for which it's uh, uh, opposite. So this is sort of when I put everything together using a z-score, if you want. And so you have all these peaks, and little numbers there are the allelic frequency of the of the minor allele frequency of the top variant. So what comes out of that? So if we look in detail at these peaks, the first striking thing is that eight out of the 15, for eight out of the 15 peaks, there is clearly a coding variant that is either the top, I was actually surprised of how often it is the top variant. We sort of don't expect to have that level of accuracy that you know, these guys would come on top, but for nearly all of them, it's the coding variant that is coming on top. So the first thing is, um, so if, if I compare with the work in human on IBD, where out of 200 and something loci, we have 10 where there's clearly a coding variant at play and all the rest is regulatory. 
Here, at least in the top ones, the proportion of low thyroid coding variants was very large. But maybe a bigger surprise was that if we look at these guys, we knew uh, three of these 15, we knew them because we had detected them as responsible for a genetic defect. So in fact, three out of the 15 corresponded to a, a genetic defect. And another one here, we don't know exactly what is happening, but there is a very highly uh, significant depletion in homozygotes. So we don't know why the homozygotes for this mutation disappear from the population. We don't have a phenotype attached to it, but the fact is that there are much fewer homozygotes than expected, so it's sort of a, a genetic defect. So, th so the first conclusion was that a, a significant part of the heritability, we'll see in a minute how much, is actually two things that one dose dosage of the, the mutation increases muscle mass, but two, and the animal uh, falls apart. And essentially these things were maintained in the population also by balancing selection until we started to select by marker assisted selection against them. And then if we look at, and so what I should also say is that these four defects are breed specific. If we look at the other coding variants, the one that I show in green here, so these are variants that are shared with other breeds, so they predate uh, the creation of that breed. And if you look at the genes underneath, there are genes that are also reported in human studies related to height, like l L, for instance, but all of them have been reported previously. So if we go down the list, so these are probably things that are affected by regulatory variation. And we started sort of to try to identify the genes using the EQTL information. And for one, I think it's quite clear, and it's again, one of these loci that seems to act on stature across species. And for the other one, I, I mentioned it, it's an interesting one. So uh, one of the coding variants that was neither in a defect nor in a known uh, gene affecting uh, height in humans is EZH2. Those of you that are doing epigenetics, when you hear EZH2, you say, oh, that's an interesting one. And, and the one that comes out regulatory is a binding par partner. So they seem sort of to be uh, potentially a uh, uh, an effect on epigenetics. So we're sort of keen to go and look at uh, chromatin uh, uh, signatures. Uh, if we put all that together, how much do these top peaks with 15,000 animals explain? Well, you know, not very much. It's the, the, it's the uh, red bar. So it can go up to 20% of the, the heritability, let's say, but certainly not more. So obviously, you know, we are trying interested sort of to, uh, to dig into the rest. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about preliminary results here. So bear with me, uh, they're not finished. But uh, the, the next phase after G was is to, is to go and do this partitioning of the heritability by genome compartment. And unfortunately, when you play with bovine, you don't have all these genome compartments ready to go. So you sort of have to generate them. So uh, people in the lab, especially Ahuko Takeda, generated a catalog of bovine attack seek peaks in 63 tissues. She obtained 1 million peaks approximately, and we sort of assigned them in an unsupervised way to 16 uh, components, but that correspond very well to anatomical systems. But so what are the key messages from these studies? When we overlay that with the genetic variants that we know of uh, in cattle, well, we find more genetic variants in these peaks than would be expected based on the proportion of the genome they represent, which I think now is sort of, uh, has also been observed in other uh, species. And this is due to the fact that these attack seek peaks are mutational hotspots. You know, the second thing here is the distribution of singletons as surrogates of de novo mutation. There's really a peak of, of uh, de novo mutations in these, uh, in these peaks. But nevertheless, if you look at the site frequency spectrum, there's evidence for purifying uh, selection. So then we have EQTL information and we sort of overlay the attack seek peaks with the uh, EQTL credible sets, and we find the expected enrichment in a tissue specific way. I won't go into too much details, uh, except to say that we use the degree of overlap between these credible sets and the attack seek peaks to try to answer two questions. What is the fraction of regulatory variants that map to attack seek peaks? And our estimates is one in three. And what is the fraction of variants mapping to attack seek peaks that are regulatory? One in 25. So essentially you say, whoop, am I really going to get as much information as I thought I would out of these uh, uh, catalogs? Sensitivity and specificity are 
maybe not as good as what we would have hoped. So then why is that? For instance, the first question, why is that? Either we don't have all the ataxic peaks, which is sure, but another possibility is that you can perturb gene switches, call EQTL effects, by being a SNP that is outside of a gene switch. I think it's very possible that contrary to what you see for coding variants, to a large extent, perturbation of gene switches may occur through the effects of variants that are not lying into the uh, gene switch. With regards to missing uh, uh, peaks, on the one hand, we probably need to go for developmental stages, et cetera. But I think an interesting thing is if you go back um, retrospectively and you take regulatory variants that have been unambiguously pinpointed by positional cloning, and you say, could I have used ataxic information to identify them more efficiently? Well, so we did that for three, three such uh, uh, regulatory variants, causative variants of phenotypes. And we know just from genetic analysis that two out of these three affect a silencer and not an enhancer. And when we look into the attack seek peaks, there are no peaks there. So it's possible, for instance, that silencer are not, uh, cannot be detected using the standard chromatin, uh, chromatin assays. And so we have data that we can't publish because nobody, no, nobody believes it, but we have, we have data from single cell RNA sequencing that actually point towards the fact that uh, repressor effects are very common in, in this case, it's the, it's the retina. So I think the, uh, there's a whole thing about silence that may be interesting to go. And I finish with the preliminary stuff, uh, just a, a few slides. So uh, once we have these uh, compartments, we do like we've learned from uh, uh, you guys about seeing, you know, if, if I go, if I look under the significance level, do I see enrichment in uh, some uh, compartments? And the first thing we did was just to go down the Manhattan plot and so see as we go down if the specific compartments are enriched. And so, so I did that by taking the first peak, taking the credible set and storing it and all the rest I throw away. And then I go to the next peak. So I don't use the SNPs that are in a peak but that are not part of the credible sets. You tell me which is a good idea or not. So we move down and then you see the different categories. And so what we see here is an enrichment of ORF altering variants in the top, but that's due to the top peaks, the one that I showed you. But I think more, more importantly is the lower line. I think if, if I look at p-values, what I believe in this thing here is a depletion of intergenic uh, regions. So I think uh, there is an enrichment of genetic regions. Can I distinguish between the genic compartments? That's another thing. If I take away the top, the top SNPs, the enrichment of the coding variants disappears, and I have this funny mountain of synonymous variants that are sort of appearing later. I think other people have described similar things. I have no idea what the uh, significance of that is. And if we bring in attack seek subdomains, then uh, so what we see is uh, an enrichment in SNPs falling into muscle specific attack peaks. Uh, attack seek peaks, you would say, oh, fantastic. But in fact, if I look where the signal is coming from, it's the same genes that are giving me the signal with the ORF altering variants. So I'm not sure what that means, but I wouldn't uh, believe it too much. And then, of course, we go to uh, variance component analysis and, and base R. And the thing is that the methods that are being described are, uh, we can talk over coffee. So the, the, the bottom line message is that whether I include or exclude the genome-wide significant signals, which clearly are enriched in, uh, in uh, coding variants, it seems that uh, N attack seek peaks and coding variants are disproportionately uh, explaining a lot, of the, a lot of the variants, but I really take this at this point with a grain of salt. So I'll, I'll let you read the, the conclusion. Sorry for hanging on over. So I'm cognizant that we've got panel discussions in a round table. I don't want to take the time for that, but I do want to have a couple of questions. Uh, so uh, can we have a couple of questions for Michelle? No, well, if not, then we will move on to the next speaker.
Um, that, I think that was a really wonderful overview. A few attacks on me, which I won't rise to right now. Um, so our next speaker is Neil Rich, um, who's going to be online. Neil, why aren't you here? Um, we all know Neil very well. Um, as past president of the American Society of Human Genetics, his uh, 1996 paper with Kathleen Merrick-Hendis underpins our whole field. But of course, he's also done a lot of modeling of uh, disease architecture. So Neil, I think you're going to be talking about major genes in complex traits. So over to you. So uh, am I sharing my slides or are they gonna do them? Uh, what, what are we going to do? What would you prefer? Either way is fine with me. If you share, then you're in control. I think that's much okay. better. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Naomi. Now, I guess I could spend 10 minutes explaining why I'm not in, <laughs> at your meeting in DC or in Bethesda today. But um, actually, this thing, I've, I've really enjoyed the meeting so far and listening to the conversations, uh, especially the one this morning. And as Xander said, I, I guess um, the, the word of the day or the key word of today is uh, context dependency. And um, I was sort of thinking how this conversation might be viewed um, if it was taking place at the Society of Epidemiologic, Epidemiologic Research. Uh, I think the comments and questions might have been somewhat different. Um, I'm going to have my genetics hat on today, but I can just tell you, many years ago when I was at Yale, uh, one of my epidemiologist colleagues asked me, like, why are you studying genetics? That's not a modifiable risk factor. But um, I think he probably wasn't anticipating CRISPR. Anyway, so when Xander asked me to talk, uh, I, I mentioned to him, well, actually, the last 10 years, mostly, I've been working a lot on Mendelian traits, and uh, could, I, could I talk about that? And he said, well, well, if you want to argue that Mendelian traits are complex, then oh, maybe. So I said, okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's easy to make an argument that, that Mendelian traits are also complex, but I guess what I'm going to talk about is the relationship between, between them. And as you see, I added something to my title, which is... Uh, um, major genes and complex traits, the confluence of forward and reverse genetics. So Mendelian, I guess I characterize Mendelian genetics as reverse genetics. Um, we're, we're talking about rare disease diagnosis. Uh, now, nowadays is being done by defining or identifying pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant or variants. Um, individual variants in these genes will have a quote, large impact. Um, these studies focus primarily on exome and adjacent intronic sites. Um, this is one per perhaps critical difference between reverse and forward genetics. Um, at least in my experience, uh, the way it's operating now is there's really no statistical inference. It's all based on subjective judgments about variant annotation using uh, current uh, annotation criteria, such as those offered by the ACMG. It really is a process of genotype to phenotype. So, so basically we identify individuals that have pathogenic or likely pathogenic uh, variants, uh, then we're in a position to try to characterize the phenotypic expression uh, related to those variants. Um, often in Mendelian genetics, the, the phenotype is syndromic. Um, that is, it, it's a constellation of multiple features, not just a single one. And um, But another hallmark um, that I've learned, <laughs> we all know actually, uh, from Mendelian genetics is the extensive clinical and phenotypic variability associated uh, with these disorders um, ranging from severe to mild to unaffected, even um, within the same family when you have individuals who have exactly the same genotype. Now, by contrast, non-Mendelian genetics I would characterize as forward genetics. So here you start with a phenotype and then you try to obtain a gen genotypic explanation. This is, would be typical of GWAS. Um, the, the challenge, of course, here and the focus is trying to functionally characterize these variants as causal. And uh, that's especially challenging because the effect sizes are modest. Um, most of these variants, as we've heard a lot about, um, most of them are non-exonic, um, suggesting and implying that they're, they're transcriptional and regulatory. And um, again, here the contrast is that these studies are based on statistics. These are require statistical evidence for association. So a lot of the, 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 the description of this session was about you know, the genetic architecture and uh, for certain kinds of disorders. Uh, and as Naomi said, um, really focusing on explanations for allele frequencies, uh, effect sizes, and then potential interactions. So um, 
For Mendelian traits, of course, uh, we know a lot of this, these frequencies are determined by selection, which is probably most often directional, but could be balancing. But also uh, very important is genetic drift. And um, of course, the degree of selection determines the potential frequency. Uh, dominant alleles, because they're directly exposed to selection, tend to be very rare. But there are a few examples where maybe not so rare, but usually that's related to late onset of the disorder or, or incomplete penetrance. Uh, recessive alleles tend to be more common, and especially um, when carriers are little or not affected. Uh, as we now realize, uh, both recessive and dominant uh, variants can uh, show founder effects. Uh, I think back in the day, if you go back maybe 30, 40 years, people would think it's really only recessive disorders that do, but we now know that actually that's not true. Um, and that uh, balancing selection can actually to lead some pretty high frequencies for quote pathogenic variants. And just a couple examples, APOL1 um, and kidney disease. And of course, we all know about G6PD deficiency. So Mendelian uh, traits um, uh, uh, have a range of phenotype expression and uh, pleiotropy. And um, as I'll show in a minute, the, the closer the phenotype you're studying to the actual direct effect of the variant, uh, the larger the effect's going to be. So <clears throat> this is a classic paper from Sir Lionel Palm Penrose. I noticed this is one that Aravinda <laughs> didn't include. I, I want to make sure I didn't overlap with what he was talking about, because of course he covered the terrain pretty well this morning. Um, this was published in the Annals of Eugenics in 1951, and basically showing that he, he characterized for a phenotype um, those who carry a predisposing genotype, in this case it's PKU. So this would be someone who has two pathogenic mutations for PKU. Um, versus a control sample that had uh, no such variants. And uh, basically what he showed in this diagram is that um, for, for individuals with PKU who are on the right in the dark shade, if you look at their phenylalanine levels in the blood, <clears throat> you're talking about 13 standard deviations difference uh, between the controls. Uh, but when you get to um, IQ, you know, now you're talking about six standard deviations difference. When you're, when you're measuring head size, now we're down to less, you know, maybe one standard deviation difference and then hair color, uh, people with PKU tend to have lighter hair color. Now you're talking about less than one standard deviation difference. So again, the point here is that, you know, phenylalanine levels are most directly related to having a missing phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme. Um, and so that's a very strong direct effect. But when you get to hair color, there's so many other factors that influence hair color that the, the effect of that gene is greatly diminished. Now there's a causal relationship, but it's sort of swamped and overwhelmed by so many other variants that are involved. So uh, here, now here we go, context dependency so of, of genetic variants. So the most obvious example I could give of context dependency, genetic context dependency is recessive variants. So a recessive variant in a heterozygote, in, a, in a, just a carrier, um, may have no effect whatever. Um, and, uh, but when it's in a homozygote, it can be pathogenic, but then it can, depends completely on what the other allele is. So, for example, in Gaucher disease, this N370S variant homozygosity uh, can lead to disease, but it's late onset and often is benign and not even individual won't even be affected. But if you're a compound heterozygote with a complete loss of function variant that's 84GG, that's now called a pathogenic combination. So the pathogenicity of this allele is completely determined by the other allele that the individual has. Now, Okay, that's for recessive variants, but for all variants, and we've already talked about this a bit, uh, polygenic background, sex, age, environment, and ancestry are all contexts that can impact the effects of those variants. So, uh, okay, so first thing I'm gonna mention, this is a paper from uh, my UCSF colleague, uh, junior colleague, David Blair, who showed that for a number, I think he looked at 50 different Mendelian disorders, he showed that actually polygenic background for the traits that are involved in this disorder actually determined whether an individual had the trait, given that they were carrying a pathogenic variant in the first place. So clearly demonstrated that pathogenic variants determine the clinical phenotype, even in the Mendelian disease. Here's another example of, of sex. So this is sex difference. So, so familial hypercholesterolemia, it turns out uh, women have higher LDL uh, who, women who have FF, FH mutations tend to have higher L, uh, LDL cholesterol than males do, and actually a higher incidence of a cardiovascular consequence from it. Um, 
age, um, obviously age has a major role here as well. As I mentioned with Gaucher disease, um, homozygotes for N370S have a late age of onset. And if your compound had for a, a, a look, complete loss of function, you're going to have much earlier onset. Environmental background, there's another obvious case, phenylketonuria, right? Uh, the expression of that gene com depends completely on diet. And if you're on a diet with heavy phenylalanine, you're going to be severely affected. But if with re removing that from the diet, you're going to be much better off. Now, here's some, now we're getting to some of the work we've done at UCSF um, over the last 10 years. So this is uh, from the CSER Consortium. Um, this is uh, clinical sequencing evidence genetic research funded by the NHGRI. There were five centers, did exome and genome sequencing for the diagnosis of uh, prenatal, NICU, and pediatric uh, patients across the five centers, over 3,000 patients. The results actually I'm going to show you are there was no association actually with genetic ancestry in this analysis, um, but there was a positive association with a number of indications. So this is work that was done by my graduate student, Yusuf Mavor at UCSF, in collaboration with many folks. But if you look, again, most of the variants discovered here were dominant. Um, some were inherited, not all de novo, many de novo, but there were recessive and excellent cases as well. But if you look at the logistic regression results uh, in the table on the right, what you're going to see is that uh, I can show you that none of these are significant. Um, none of the ancestry results for any of these ancestors are significant, but uh, sex was uh, 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 male sex with females rough, so males were less affected. And on the number of indications, if you had more than one indication, it increased your risk or you increased the probability you're going to get a genetic diagnosis. So now, what about common or con quote complex traits? So um, in terms of allele frequencies, uh, low-risk variants are, I would say, largely unaffected by selection, so they can occur at all frequencies. So that's not entirely true, but mostly true, perhaps. Uh, the problem is uh, detection power is really, really high for more common low-risk variants in association studies. So on the other hand, um, using Mendelian, uh, Mendelian results, um, we can characterize, uh, still characterize low potential low-risk variants by annotation. So Again, characterizing missense or loss of function variants to be included in association studies uh, by, by combining them, even if they're low frequency, they can, they can still be identified uh, statistically. Uh, but I would, I would suggest that perhaps uh, non-exonic low-risk variants may be largely missing. They're, I would imagine they're quite prevalent, but might be missing just because of the statistical power. Um, there are examples where higher risk variants can be more common when there's balancing selection. Um, so uh, just the example HLA um, would be an example of this. Uh, there are some very moderately high risk variants for type one diabetes, for example, which historically would have had a lot of selection, but they're still occurring with high frequency. As we know, there's tremendous um, balancing selection occurring um, at that, in that region. Um, so actually one thing I was thinking in the discussion this morning, um, you know, if you're talking about traits like blood pressure or lipids or whatever, there's actually potential disadvantages of being at either extreme. So so the optimal phenotype is somewhere probably in the middle. Um, and and that, that optimum can actually change uh, depending on the environmental situation, but still a uh, selection could be occurring at both ends of the distribution, which is going to push, you know, variance, you know, which is going to push for polymorphism and more higher allele frequencies towards pushing people towards the center. Uh, in terms of effect sizes for common alleles, uh, we have the same sort of phenomena of pleiotropy and context dependency. So this is just one example of, of pleiotropy. This is um, uh, work with John Witte um, when he was at UCSF, this Hoxby 13 G84 allele. This was actually work that Tom Hoffman did. Um, basically, if you look here, uh, this, this variant uh, has a frequency of being maybe about half a percent in Europeans. The odds ratio for prostate cancer is about 3.6, but you can see there's a bunch of other cancers for which this looks to be a predis predisposing factor if you look at the column of odds ratios. Blood pressure, okay, uh, context of sex. Um, this was already mentioned this morning. Uh, blood pressure has higher heritability in women, and uh, overall, it, it appears that some of the effect sizes are greater in women than in men. Um, age, uh, I would imagine that for many polygenic risk scores, uh, the, the effect is greater um, at younger age, and I think that's true for cardiovascular-related conditions. Um, 
In terms of environment, I would I would suggest that pharmacogenetics is actually a, a, a very good example of an environmental context for SNP effects. Um, so basically, what you, what you're going to do is you're going to compare uh, regression coefficients of a SNP uh, for individuals when they're exposed or not exposed to the drug. An example from this is um, one of our junior faculty, um, Akinyemi Onyorison at UCSF, uh, looking at the results of statins, um, whether the effect sizes of variants differ when an individual is on statins versus not. You can see there are three SNPs here for which that's true. And if you look at the beta coefficients, you can see they're statistically significantly different. So I would argue here's a good example of, a, of an environmental exposure, an exogenous environmental exposure where, where the SNP effects uh, differ. <clears throat> now, of course, this has great significance in terms of doing pharmacogenetics. Okay, now what about ancestry? So uh, here's an example of genetic ancestry. So this is cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which uh, this is work of Eric Jorgensen our, on our Kaiser Jira cohort, um, basically showed that, uh, first of all, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is dramatically more common in whites than any other group. It's has a moderate frequency in Latinos if you look at the ethnicity frequencies here, but it's very uncommon in East Asians or African Americans. Okay, and it turns out there's a very strong ancestry effect, a genetic ancestry effect here. On the right, you can see the Europeans, and it's really highest the farther north you go in Europe. But it's also true in Latinos. Um, the more European ancestry, the higher the risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Now, what turns out is um, in terms of the genetic ancestry, a skin pigmentation, a genetic prediction, or a polygenic risk score for it, um, all of these effects are larger in Latinos actually than in the non-Hispanic whites. Uh, the genetic ancestry effects are stronger and, and this, the pigmentation effects are stronger. So in, the con in this context, there appears to be a genetic uh, context here in which these SNPs are operating in terms of ancestry. But here's an example of exactly the opposite, another skin phenotype. This is atopic dermatitis, which is twice as common in African-Americans. Um, this, this is again in our JIRA cohort. If you look, you can see the first row, twice as common in African-Americans. Um, when we looked at genetic ancestry, which is the first row, no relationship to genetic ancestry in the African-Americans. There was no higher risk associated with African ancestry. Um, when we look at African ancestry by itself, without including the race variable, it's, it's highly significant. When we include both the race variable and African ancestry in the entire cohort of, of whites and African Americans, only the race variable is significant. The same thing happens when we include a skin prediction. By itself, it's predictive, but including the race variable, it's no longer predictive. The polygenic risk score for atopic dermatitis is highly significant in the whites, and it's not at all significant in, in the African Americans. So again, this is this is a context of a race, ethnicity, or ancestry related context that appears to be entirely environmental. So now to the topic of the role of major genes um, for non Mendelian traits. So I, I refer to this as the confluence of forward and reverse genetics. Um, typically, these variants are identified by reverse genetics, positional cloning, or association studies. Um, but basically, what it results in is a phenotypic characterization of a Mendelian subset of disease. But the big question is, how relevant is this, sub this subset etiologically to the remainder of the trait that doesn't have a major gene effect? Um, historically, um, this was done by segregation in families. These genes were found that way. Uh, for example, BRC1 and 2, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, FH. Maybe Naomi will talk about this. It doesn't seem that to be true. Uh, these kind of pedigrees do not exist, or the, the variants of segregating don't exist for some psychiatric disorders. But now I would think that we have de novo is a strong criterion now for autosomal dominant disorders. And um, it's not clear whether de novo variants, uh, well, they don't contribute probably to family, uh, family based heritability. So we, it's not clear how much they contribute to disease overall. but they may have relevance for finding non-pathogenic uh, non or non-LP variants. So um, <clears throat> for example, um, we know that in the lipidus, in our analyses, um, all the Mendelian lipid disorders have common GWAS hits in them, suggesting that they're common etiologic pathways. But if we look at blood pressure, that doesn't seem to be the case. The Mendelian blood pressure syndromes um, don't seem to have these, these common variants in them. And uh, for a more comprehensive look at this, um, my colleague, UCSF colleague, Catherine, Catherine Chanjiu, who's I think in the audience there, did a more comprehensive study looking at uh, phenomite associations uh, in 26 Mendelian genes, showing that there are common variants uh, 
uh, both common and rare variants that have phenotypic expression within those genes. So in summary, I guess I'd say, I said, my view, all traits are complex, uh, depending on how you're defining the trait. Um, forward and reverse genetics are complementary approaches uh, that can help understand uh, trait genetic complexity. Um, major genes for common traits provides a confluence of these two approaches, which may have been, which I think, you know, there are people who really only like to do Mendelian genetics because they love the biology, but that's not the reality of the world because so much of, of disease is not, not Mendelian. Um, and I think both can contribute to understanding and uh, background genetic and demographic effects I've shown can have strong impacts on these underlying traits. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Neil. That was a really lovely overview of many, uh, many, uh, many papers and things. So um, any questions for Neil? Bruce. Hi, Neil. Bruce Walsh. Excellent talk. I really like how you frame a lot of these issues from the population genetic perspective. Um, if you have a trait that's under optimal selection, the trait itself is an optimal uh, uh, intermediate for it. The underlying loci are actually under under dominant selection. Alan Robertson showed this in the 50s, very counterintuitive. So if you have additive genes and an optimal selection, actually selection tends to remove variation, not maintain it. And that removes the balancing selection. So, right. So if you were doing like, we just heard about uh, the cattle. <laughs> um, if you're doing directional selection, I, that's right. That's what's gonna happen. But that's not, I'm not sure that's what happens in a natural population, because I think what happens in a natural population is not selection for the extreme, but selection for the middle. So for example, you're, you're gonna be in trouble if you have like a blood pressure of like 180 over hundred, but you're probably also gonna be in trouble if your blood pressure is like 80 over 40 or, or something like that. So you don't wanna be in either extreme. You wanna see be in the middle. And that's what I was sort of arguing the balancing selection because you know, that's going to push all these variants, you know, uh, to be polymorphic, to be in the middle, because the middle is actually the optimum, not either end. Yeah, Neil, that's that answering your point. question. I'm not sure that's answering the question. But. So that's actually my point. If you have an intermediate optimum for the tree, yeah. your lying low side are actually under, under dominant selections, very counterintuitive. But Alan Robertson showed this the 50s. I'll send that stuff to you. But this was shown in the 50s. Very well, counterintuitive. Yeah, that's kind of, it is counterintuitive. I just wonder if that's true for like some of the human traits that we've been talking about. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions um, and then we can carry on in the discussion. So, Loic? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Loic Yango, University Hi, of Queensland. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering about your some of the observations you showed us uh, about the effect sizes being different in different groups. And I was wondering to which extent that can be uh, predicted uh, from knowing prevalences, because when you, for some of your me measures of odds ratios, they are sort of dependent on the prevalence and you're starting your point saying that the prevalence is different. And I was wondering to which extent some of those effect sizes were essentially scale dependent. So I don't, you know, um, I'm not sure I could have predicted, like with the atopic dermatitis, for example, um, it's twice as common in African-Americans I don't know that I could have predicted beforehand that it had nothing to do with genetic ancestry, that that difference had nothing to do with genetic ancestry. I think with squamous cell carcinoma, because you knowing squamous cell carcinoma is skin pigment related, uh, that 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 was, is sort of what I would have predicted. But the atopic, and we're sort of left bewildered in a way because I showed you it also is not related to skin pigmentation genetics, genetically predicted skin pigmentation. Um, which probably is correlated with some social factors also among African-Americans. So I don't know that we, and I told you that the PRS for that is null in African-Americans. So I don't know, you know, there could be difference in allele frequencies underlying that PRS, but I, my suspicion is it's just the, the variants are not operating in the same way in those contexts. And um, I guess the point I was trying to make is that um, when you have an ancestry context, it could be Genetic ancestry, that's the issue, or it could be environmental correlates with genetic ancestry, that's the issue. And I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily know beforehand. I mean, but are you suggesting you might? Um, you might know? Uh, no, I wasn't suggesting that. <laughs> oh, okay. I, okay, I wasn't sure. Well, that, well, that would be great. I mean, if you had some other uh, you know, information or evidence to suggest where how it should go, I mean, I think that would be really useful, sure. 
Okay, um, Aravind, if you don't mind, I think we'll move on and leave your question to the panel discussion. That's okay. Um, so the next piece. Oh, uh, okay. Wanted that set up. So um, thank you, Neil. Um, hope you'll be there and for the discussion. Yeah. So move on to my slide. So we didn't um, confer before uh, the talks, but I think we've made a really nice um, session with uh, covering different topics. So in my talk, I am going to um, try and contrast evidence of genetic architectures and do a very, uh, introduce many papers with a very quick skim over the top hoping to kind of trigger things for the discussion later on. And some of the things I'm talking about are, are not my expertise at all. So essentially we had two prompts. One was about genetic architecture examples and one was about evolutionary processes. And so I'm gonna start at looking at um, genetic architectures, essentially increasing a complexity in the types of phenotypes. So I'm gonna start with the EQTL gen paper. We heard this morning about EQTLs so in this paper of um, 32,000 people with gene expression in blood, they identified 88% of genes had a cis EQTL. So um, in less than one megabase from uh, the gene. Uh, and of those 92% were within hundred kilobases. And those without a cis EQTL had evidence for selection constraint. That paper also looked at trans EQTLs. I'll think about those in the context of this proteomics paper. So protein QTLs, this was the UK Biobank paper published this year, um, nearly 3000 proteins. So on the left-hand side, we've got the um, chromosome position plot and the red dots are the cis PQTLs and the blue dots are the trans PQTLs. Again, it was about 82%, oh, I think 88% of proteins had a cis PQTL for the gene which encodes them. The bar chart across the top shows um, the number of proteins associated with different positions in the, in the genome. In terms of SNP-based heritability, the average SNP-based heritability was about 16%. Of that, about 20% was explained by the PQTLs and 10% from the trans PQTLs. And in terms of sample size on the right-hand side, you can see as that sample size increased, we weren't detecting more cis PQTLs after about the sample size of uh, 10,000, but as sample size increases, identify more and more trans PQTLs. In terms of what trans effects could look like, I like this example of fatty acids. Obviously, fatty acids come from the diet, but there's enzymes which change fatty acid composition. So we can see in this known pathway of fatty acids, if we do a GWAS on the uh, first fatty acid, then one um, locus comes up. When you go the next one down the pathway, you, the first uh, locus remains and a new one comes, third one down the pathway, the first two are still there and a the third one comes. So I think that's a nice example of um, uh, pathway results. Increasing in complexity here, I'm looking at vitamin D. This is a UK biobank study that I led with John McGrath. And so, um, Vitamin D is obviously a blood biomarker, more complex at gene expression. As you can from, see from the genome-wide association plots, there's um, variance from the strength of the association. You can detect that there's variance of large effect, uh, but still very polygenic. And I guess what was surprising to John and I, because we're used to looking at psychiatric disorders, was just how interpretable those results were in terms of what's known about vitamin D metabolism, in terms of properties of the skin, in terms of uh, lipid and lipoprotein pathways, in terms of liver metabolism in general. Just highlighting this paper from Jonathan Pritchard's group, uh, which we talked about this morning, how the um, EQTLs uh, can be mapped to um, genomic annotations and promoters and not so for uh, the GWAS results. And um, just again, putting this a trigger for discussion, we had some discussion about that this morning and how that's interpreted. So moving on, uh, the graph on the left hand side is a kind of the old way that we used to look at genetic architecture. So on the X axis, we've got number of cases, the Y axis, the number of associations. And here contrasting Crohn's disease and schizophrenia, both of which are relatively uncommon, half to 1%, both of which have relatively similar architecture, about 
but uh, we identified variants for Crohn's disease with much smaller sample sizes than for schizophrenia. And then on the right hand side, looking at what, you know, now we've uh, further down the GWAS track for both these disorders. I really like this review on inflammatory bowel disease where uh, I think we've got more than 200 loci and those variants can be mapped to genes and the genes can be interpreted in the general, um, what's known about inflammatory bowel disease, but still very complex, many pathways reflecting the uh, structure of the gut, the interactions with the host micro microbes, the fact that it's an inflammatory disease and the in infection responses. In contrast, we've got the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium paper last year, which now has 77,000 cases. We've got 287 loci. Again, we try to interpret those results um, with post-GWAS analyses and interpret them in terms of synaptic biology. But I would say the interpretation is, for me, less clear than this example of inflammatory bowel disease. So taking this forward now, comparing two disorders, uh, one of the brain and one of the gut, now common disorders, so I've put them onto this, uh, I've extended this uh, plot a bit on the X and the Y axis. And so again, contrasting that these two disorders, which have got similar, similarly common in the population, 12% for diverticulosis, 15% for major depression, similar heritabilities, but again, much smaller number of cases were needed to identify um, a large number of variants. Taking this example forward, um, so on the right hand side, major depression, this is the latest results in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. We have 525,000 cases. We've now identified more than 600 loci. You can see from the y-axis, the minus log 10 p-values go up to about 40, which is much um, lower number than on the left hand side for diverticulosis, where with just 77,000 cases, you can see much um, higher minus log 10 p-values indicative of larger effect sizes. So diverticulosis is very common. I don't think many people have actually heard of it because it's not a disorder we talk about. Bleeding out of your backside is not the sort of thing you tend to tell even your um, family, let alone your friends. But yet it is very common. And what was again striking to me, this is what my PhD student did, um, was how interpretable those results were compared to my work with the psychiatric disorders. So we could map the SNPs to genes, the nearest gene, and those were interpretable in terms of the structure of the, the intestine, gut motility, elasticity of the gut. And this is a disorder where most people uh, comment, uh, you know, you're told it's uh, about diet, but clearly the genetic contribution is important as well. So in that first half of the talk, I tried to whiz through complexity of, of traits and showing how results uh, from these um, complex diseases uh, are interpretable, even though there's increasing complex complexity. complexity. So now going on to prompt two. So this is a, a classic way that we uh, think about uh, selection and the evidence of selection. So on the X axis, we've got minor allele frequency and the Y axis effect size. And you can see this, this um, the shape of curves, exactly what we expect when uh, the selection is taking place, that variants of large effect are, are only likely to be uh, present in the population at low frequencies and otherwise the selection uh, acts to to stop them from getting too high frequency. So here showing this for height on the left hand side and schizophrenia on the right hand side. In the top right I've got my PhD student and her primary supervisor Alan McRae. She's got a study which is under review now where she identified variants which are antagonistic. So looked for GWAS for, for uh, regions where or, or SNPs which are associated with two traits but uh, if you kind of map them to um, what you'd expect the direction to be for fitness but they were opposite and what she found was that if you've got SNPs which are it's hard without a pointer but you can see on that example of the height graph there's, there's two dots which seem to be have a larger effect size than you'd expect from their minor allele frequency and she was finding those are tending to be the ones which are antagonistic effects, which is, I think, what you'd expect from um, evolutionary theory. So just to say, evolutionary theory applied to GWAS results is a very active area of research and not one that I'm an expert in at all. I've put up a whole series of papers. Apologies, I've missed some. The point of these is to trigger people's memories of, of what's out there because many of the uh, senior authors are here in the audience and uh, should be contributing to the discussion. 
So I'm going to talk about one, uh, some evolution analyses that we did in two papers, one in 2018 and uh, the other in 2021. The first one ba was based on individual level data and the second one uh, carrying the method forward into GWAS summary statistics. This is work led by uh, the amazing Zhang Zheng and Zhang Yang. And so um, this is a Bayesian regression, random regression model. You, most of you will be familiar with this type of model where we're relating phenotype to genetic effect sizes through their, through their genotypes. And so the beta effects could be drawn from um, two distributions, either have no effect at all or a proportion have an effect where their effect sizes are drawn from a normal distribution with the variance such that the effect size is effect size is related to the heterozygosity or allele frequency. And so that relationship between effect size and allele frequency is, is measured by this coefficient S. So from these methods, we can estimate three key parameters from gen for, for genetic architecture, the SNP-based heritability, that selection coefficient S, which relates at minor allele frequency to effect size, and this polygenicity parameter, what proportion of SNPs have an effect. And so in terms of results on the left-hand side, contrasting height and BMI, and the distribution is the posterior distribution from, um, from the analyses, from the Bayesian analysis. And so you can see that um, uh, BMI is more polygenic than, than height, that uh, height has got a higher SNP-based heritability than BMI, and this selection coefficient is more negative, is negative for both traits, but more negative for height. And then contrasting these selection parameters for different types of traits, disease traits, reproductive traits, physical measures, and cognitive traits. And just a very whiz summary of this is to pick out a couple of things that the polygenicity estimate seems to be much lower for these disease traits than for physical traits or cognitive traits. We've got a couple of outliers in the disease traits, and this one is schizophrenia, and this one is bipolar disorder. So these are um, obviously traits of the brain, which kind of link them down to these traits down here. And in terms of selection coefficient, a stronger S coefficient for these disease traits than for cognitive traits. And since previously I was contrasting um, blood biomarkers, gut disorders, and um, the psychiatric disorders, I just made a, a plot of those. Again, showing uh, much higher polygenicity for the psychiatric disorders compared to the gut disorders and stronger S coefficients, more negative S coefficients for the gut disorders than the brain disorders. So to interpret these, we did some evolutionary uh, simulations. When I say we, it's actually Zhang Zheng. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information on here. I don't expect you to look at the detail, but just to say these were bona fide slim three evolutionary forward, forward simulation models where over time there's new mutations. The mutations could either have a neutral effect or uh, have a, an effect on, on fitness with pleiotropic effects on traits and going through 58,000 generations, or, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the last generation, we generate GWAS data, which we can then analyze in the same way that we do the actual empirical traits. So in these simulations, the key input parameters that are varied are the selection coefficient with the relationship to fitness, the proportion of mutations that have a causal effect, and the proportion of phenotypic variation attributable to causal mutations. And then the key output parameters are this S selection coefficient, the polygenicity parameter, and the S-based heritability, SNP-based heritability. So again, summarizing very quickly the results, again, emphasizing that there were input parameters to the simulation and output parameters. And you can see that they are kind of related to each other, but just to emphasize that they're not exactly the same. And so a key thing that we found was the interde interdependence of the um, underlying evolutionary input parameters, such that when we, the things that we can estimate from the real data, we found that we can't, you can't just interpret them on their own. You have to interpret them as a package. So for example, if we did a sim simulation where we had the same proportion of mutations that are causal for the trait, if we had a high selection strength uh, simulation and a low se selection strength simulation, then the estimate of polygenicity would be different, even though the proportion of mutations for the causal trait were the same. So what that meant was that um, for our empirical results, where we showed that those cognitive traits seem to have a less negative 
S coefficient. In fact, that would happen uh, because of um, the large mutational target. And so if you account for the fact that the large mutational, there's a much larger mutational target, then in fact, um, the simulation suggested that the selection strength from an evolutionary point would actually have been higher on the cognitive traits. And similarly, that very negative S, S estimate for disease traits is because they've got a lower mutational target. And of course, the estimates of uh, these large mutational target size necessarily impl implicates widespread pleiotropy. Um, so I'm just going to end with uh, acknowledging that the uh, moderator of the discussion panel is Guy here, who's just had a paper put on BioArchive, which also looks at this evolutionary modeling to uh, GWAS some sense. So I just wanted to give him a shout out as a, a, another trigger for discussion. And with that, uh, my acknowledgements of funding. Thank you. So any questions for me? Uh, you might disagree whether I said I had to fly through lots of things very quickly. Um, essentially, I was presenting a lot of uh, overview of work. So um, I'd be happy to leave it to the panel discussion unless there's burning questions. Um, Naomi, there's a question online for you. Um, thank you for a great talk. In the s base method, how does the S relate to a locus-specific selection coefficient? So the locus, well, there isn't a locus specific selection coefficient because, so the S is relating the um, allele frequency to the effect size is modeling that, but selection is based on a set of variants and their relationship to fit, the fitness trade. So yeah, I think the question related to genome wide selection versus locus specific selection, yeah. Um, well, the the effects of the variants are cumulative across the genome to make a trait of fitness and selection acts on that trait. So that will how yeah. Thank you for nodding at me, Molly. <laughs> Mike. The, the fact that it's very hard to find uh, GUI hits for major depression, it, is that because it's lowly heritable or or does these simulation results explain why it's there's so few hits for major depression? Sorry, I flew through that. There aren't few. Um, now we've got, uh, I think, 600 hits for major depression from a massive sample size, of half a million cases. And so we do have the hits, even though major depression is a very heterogeneous phenotype. Um, and we can interpret those results in post GWAS analyses where we integrate them, say, with single cell sequencing results, where we can see that they map to, you know, they're enriched when you um, uh, map to expression in the brain and particular cell types. So we can interpret them. But the point I was trying to make is that I feel that less interpretable than the, than the, those disorders of the gut. And, and what is it about the uh, architecture of depression that makes it so difficult to find those hits that you needed such large sample size? Well, I think what, so, lar so large sample sizes means that the, yeah, essentially we've got more variants and the effect sizes are small. And that's what we're showing, I think, also with that evolutionary modeling that the, essentially the mutational target size for brain traits is is larger, that's how I'm interpreting it. Does that make sense? Um, I, I just want to follow up on Mike's question. Do you think for the cognitive behavioral phenotypes, the GWAS are not interpretable in theory or just in practice? Sorry, I, I, I don't want to say they're not interpretable. It's more of a relative thing. Um, and I think the, um, yeah, the key thing is, yeah, disorders, maybe the, you know, what does polygyny mean? It means that there's many backup routes. There's many, many ways to get to the same phenotype, which means there's, you know, so maybe the brain needs to be more protective. And of course, may, another reason why maybe they're less interpretable is because it's harder to study the, the brain in general. And we've got less knowledge to, to map it onto. But uh, I think by putting the results together with that evolutionary modeling was trying to show, say that the, you know, the mutational target seems to be higher for those uh, cognitive traits. Yeah. 
So I think we should move on to the panel discussion. Um, yeah. Uh, relating to this last thing. In general, genes expressed in the brain are larger. They also have larger first introns with regulatory elements. If you correct for that, have you tried to see whether the number of genes, I mean, we sort of somehow assume that polygenicity is high, so therefore there are more genes, but that sort of has an embedded assumption all genes are of the same size and equal importance. So um, do we do we really know that or that um, well, some genes are longer and therefore the mutational target is larger or? Well, um, in general, when people are studying the psychiatric disorders, we recognize that uh, the brain genes are longer and all the post GWAS analyses will account for that. The point I was trying to make in this very quick talk was asking about this, trying to address that evolutionary um, modeling um, point that we were prompted with and saying that I feel like the evidence from, the, from our modeling is that these cognitive traits seem to have a higher mutational target. So I'm going to pass over to the uh, panel discussion now. Okay, so just uh, to get started with a couple of questions based on some prompts we got from uh, the organizer. So one, one question that maybe we could actually go through pretty quickly is uh, um, what do we uh, know and not know about the genetic architecture of complex traits defined as it was defined by Nomi, I think, uh, previously in terms of the number of variants and their joint distribution of uh, frequencies and effect sizes. And just to give some elaborations, what do we know about the genetic architecture of common variants versus rare variants? Another one is when we learn about them, do we expect, so we measure the effect sizes and we measure the frequencies in these data sets, and then maybe there's some issue a fine mapping, but also the effect sizes we get uh, in GWAS are subject to confounding and whether we expect this confounding to be different for different kinds of traits. So that's um, another pointer on that. And, um, and then maybe how we expect this genetic architecture to, and what we know about how it looks different in different human populations. So that's um, a one question. And just a second question, just relating it to um, the topics of the other sessions here is, okay, we got this object, which is the joint uh, frequency distribution and number of variants. Um, then how could we tie that into the biology of the traits? So um, maybe feel free, so uh, yeah, so. Yeah, why don't uh, okay. You hold it? Yeah. Uh, no. uh yeah, I mean I think I maybe agree with what you're maybe saying, which is um confounding is just gonna turn on every SNP, right? Like like so population stratification should be this teeny little signal that hits on every SNP. So the bigger the can speak into the microphone. The bigger the the bigger uh okay. Yeah, um, yeah. the traits with more stratification bias should have way more tiny little effects distributed across the genome. Uh, that should look like polygenicity. Um, I don't really know. I think that like maybe this is more of a question than an answer, but I think the different methods give quite different answers as to how polygenic things are. Um, I'm not, I don't feel like I have a good understanding for why different things are polygenic. I definitely feel like the complexity of depression and heterogeneity is likely a contributor to why it's so polygenic. Um, but I definitely don't know that that's the only thing. Yeah. Um. So maybe, maybe the best way to phrase this discussion is to think that as an organism, we have two conflicting things we must do. Number one, we must be have our developmental system buffered enough that we'll get to a reasonable outcome, no matter how bad the situation is. But number two, we also must have it flexible enough to respond to subtle changes. And getting that fine balance, I think, is very tricky. And I think that under, an understanding of that, things like small world scale-free networks and things like that and the robustness they have in them, I think an understanding that is kind of the underpinning to a lot of these architectural issues. 
most of the pop gen models people have worked out. And by the way, the dirty little secret that no one will tell you is evolutionary population genesis has been trying to figure out models for the maintenance of quantitative genetic variation and incredibly elegant models, none of which work. They all have little flaws if you look at them carefully and it's still in the process of being resolved. But I think understanding the, the fact that systems are buffered. And just the final point I make is that there's some classic work from fly and mice people in the 50s and 60s, where you take a gene that a trait that shows essentially no variation and you introduce a single major mutation, that's it. And all of a sudden it shifts the trait distribution and there's a huge amount of hidden variation that's uncovered in that. So systems are incredibly well buffered. And I think in understanding that buffering, which is more systems biology, I think will give us some more insight into architecture. So that's a great non-answer for you. Um, so I think kind of building on Naomi's um, nice presentation of some of the S phase S work, one thing I really appreciated about that is you get you have the ability to look at some consistently done analyses, looking at GWAS that have been run in the same cohorts across similar traits. You've got like a pretty comparable setup and you can say how consistently polygenic or inconsistently polygenic are different classes of traits. So I think there's some nice leverage from massive study designs that we've had recently in big biobanks where we can start to tease those apart. And from those, I think it's become very clear, like biomarkers are a whole lot less polygenic um, by and large, things like LDL cholesterol and things that are just circulating in the blood. It's a whole lot less polygenic than things like say schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which seem to be on another end of the spectrum along with height and other, other really complex traits that we treat as sort of like these model phenotypes. Um, you know, BMI is there too. But we're really interested in those really complicated things. Um, so when thinking about, you know, clinical models for cardiovascular disease, for example, we know that some of the causal risk factors for those include LDL, relatively simple, blood pressure on the simpler end, BMI, really complicated. Um, and so putting all of that together, it's really hard to think about how you get towards modeling the genetic architecture of really complex traits that are sort of related to other traits. Like that pleiotropia is really going to impact, I think, the genetic architecture that we're fundamentally trying to measure with disease-oriented traits. And so looking across and trying to get at measures of genetic architecture in a consistent setup is really nice and really helpful. But at the end of the day, like what, <laughs> how, where, what progress can we make when we don't really fully understand in absolute terms what the like, you know, number of causal variants that we're sort of shooting for to try to understand the full molecular basis of these diseases actually is. So there's, I think, still a lot to be worked out on that front. Yeah. Suhini? Hi. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if I would be a disembodied voice because I couldn't see myself on the screen. Yeah, I, I think everybody brings up really good points. Um, as an evolutionary population geneticist, I also agree there's a lot of buffering in the system to um, the second point made. And, and I guess, you know, just Alicia basically said what I was thinking about, but maybe another, another thing, another question that comes up for me with this question is, um, and Michelle touched on this, the role of just allelic heterogeneity in traits too. So you can talk about like consistency as Alicia did in kind of biobank-based studies. And I think the SBSS work is like really nice example of that. But um, yeah, going back to Arvin, this point on hierarchical organization of SNPs, I think some of what we've seen in this session is also touching on the fact that even just at the sequence level, there's some heterogeneity and how the same trait can be generated. And, and that's something that, you know, um, I think it's kind of interesting to bring to this question as well. Well, maybe I'll say uh, one thing uh, relating to this work that uh, Naomi mentioned, that's with Yuval uh, Simmons and with Jonathan Pritchard, that's somewhere over here, um, that, so what we did there is we looked at 95 quantitative traits and just looked at those where in the UK Biobank, you have over hundred hits to have enough power to look at and what we are pretty certain at this point that we found is that when you look at the joint distributions of frequencies and effect size, um, then, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start a step before is if you would imagine a situation where all complex traits have the same distribution of uh, frequencies and effect size, and then you would ask, how would you expect it to look under a GWAS? then what you would expect that uh, you need to do a certain scaling 
basically based on the heritability and the trait and and uh, the number of sites in the genome affecting them just because of power in GWAS. Because to identify a given variant, then then your power reduces the more variants that you have and, and uh, the environmental variants also diminishes this. So you if everything would look the same, the same distribution, then you would have to do the scaling in order to compare the GWAS and different traits. And quite surprisingly, it seems that when you actually do that scaling, then a lot of uh, highly quantitative traits have extremely similar architecture. Um, so similar architecture in the distribution of effect sizes and frequency, but they differ a lot in the target size, as it's been pointed out by different people. And we would expect them to differ by the target size because different traits are different, even though I think there's deeper questions to explore about uh, that. Um, but maybe I can ask a second just relating. OK, so I'm done with that. So maybe just to connect it to the um, session we saw this morning. So now, you know, now we have this, uh, this architecture as defined by in, in the GWAS community as joint distribution of effect sizes and frequencies. and uh, the polygenicity, then now how do we relate it to the biology of traits? I'm just throwing this out there because we're supposed to point out uh, gaps. So it struck me that the, uh, the scaling effect would relate to mutational target size. And uh, the uh, evolutionary effect would be that the stronger there is selection on the, the trait, the, uh, tighter the, the tighter the association between effect size and frequency. If there's no association, then you have neutrality of Watterson distribution. So I think you you have the underlying biology, which gives you the target size. Then you have evolution, which basically gives you how tight is that connection. It is our allele, our, our major alleles tending to be rare, right? If there's stronger selection, that tendency should be amplified. That's what S that Nilm was talking about. If that tendency is weak, S should approach zero. There's no association. And I think that's one way you kind of think about target size versus evolutionary history. It's a crude way, but it gives you some, something to think about. By the way, you should uh, feel in, feel free to expand the discussion. Uh, yeah. to I'm, I'm learning. Most you know, importantly, yeah. feel free to object, uh, you know, contouring viewpoints. These meetings are only fine when there's respectable tension. If we all agree, then we might as well go home. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that biology is more about, like, cell types and and these things right i mean so the the gwas sits are so i guess i've been thinking about a thing brandon on the computer said earlier this morning which is like i spend all my time thinking about protein interactions and i never actually explain anything about the complex trait variation and i have like the opposite problem like i spend all my time thinking about like this sort of r squared especially in sample especially in european ancestry individuals who are white british and live in the uk right um, and I spent like zero time actually doing biology and I'm trying to like actually get to cells and to genes and to drug targets to actually like cure diseases. Um, and so that's, I guess, more the, the type of direction I'm trying to go is to move backwards from the complex trade associations and to funnel these things back into mechanisms that are a little bit more tractable and uh, we could work on. And then I guess to make it G by E ish, like presumably the E's are going to be working through similar mechanisms. Um, like they're going to be sort of funneled together through this thing that Thule showed with the little, the pyramid of things funneling together. Right? Um, so I want to find these little nodes in that network and um, treat disease by hitting them. Yeah. Um, I guess there's a few potential directions to go with this. So, one, some of these um, sort of polygenicity estimates understanding like methods to try to understand genetic architecture or cross traits are of course a little bit sensitive to confounding are sensitive to like how well have you controlled for population stratification if that's even like the overall goal um and so we can when looking across the world so to your point of looking at diverse populations that can get a little tricky if you have controlled for population stratification in different ways or or different ancestries in different ways um, and then, you know, you're, <laughs> to your point, if you're also interested in trying to layer on environmental contributions with genetic contributions to better understand 
complex trait genetic architecture overall, then that becomes a fairly tricky problem. But I think we're not totally lost here. Like we can couple genetic tools with other multi-omic tools as Thule already started mentioning. And I actually have had a lot of hope and inspiration lately from um, some of the work that Naomi mentioned on the proteomics front. Um, so she mentioned the massive discovery in um, proteomics, like PQTLs, for example, like the vast majority of genes have uh, locally associated um, cis PQTL associated with the protein levels. Um, but one thing that I found that's incredibly cool is that the proteins themselves are not just related to um, the regulatory architecture of expression, but they're also incredibly re related to environment. Um, so if you look at like how much of the proteome is perturbed by smoking, let's say, which is one of the very, very, very easiest possible places to start when looking at the environment, um, the plasma proteome is like just hammered by smoking, like half a third to half of the proteome is vastly significantly responsive to that. So when trying to understand complex traits overall, obviously this is a genetic and environmental conversation we need to be having. Um, and so I think we also need to be appreciative of like the multi-omic tools that we have at our disposal to try to dissect both inherited and modifiable risk factors. Um, and that gives us some like really cool tools to try to leverage and understand like disease insights. So maybe just rambling on a little bit further, um, COPD, is like a drug, or is like a disease of smoking, basically. Um, proteins that predict smoking also predict COPD. Um, but if you build a spore to try to predict smoking um, with these proteins, you do a really good job at predicting smoking. You can also predict COPD incidence in never smokers, which is really cool. So that's telling us that we can fundamentally learn from these multi-omic technologies about shared biological insults um, from our broad exposures that gives us a nice lever, I would say, to try to dissect architectures of disease that are not necessarily always inherited, but have a common biological process. And that then gives us a tool to try to understand and dissect these like fundamental molecular um, mechanisms or tissues or pathways um, that are related to those. So sorry for the massive tangent, but. <laughs> it's all about tangents. Um... Suhini, do you want to weigh in? Well, I kind of want to ask Alicia to continue on her tangent, which relates to a point that Neil's brought up in the chat, which is that we haven't talked a lot about defining traits in this meeting yet. And that is, you know, especially as we talk about pleiotropy more and, you know, um, the fact that we've largely been talking, even as we talk about suites of traits, looking at them kind of one by one versus maybe looking at them in a sort of joint way or multivariate way. And Alicia's done really cool work on, on this recently in predictability. And I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I feel like I have already absorbed a fair bit of rambling time, but I'm happy to continue expounding if you'd like. <laughs> but I think it's an interesting point um, to, yeah, that, you know, when we, and it came up in NASA's talk too, right? Like that the way that we def we are limited in some ways, especially with biobank scale data sets and the way that we're defining traits and that that might also be affecting the insights we're getting. I have a question. I mean, sorry, this is Catherine. I, I, I was actually having a thought in the same uh, line, which is um, a, lot of, a lot of what we do, especially like DOAs and complex diseases. And also when we look at the population diversity background, we see that a lot of the polygenicity that we find, especially in European, doesn't necessarily translate in other population. Question is, and we know that they always say that the biology of the disease is the same across populations. So the, the main question often is what are the factors that are driving these differences? But one thing that I've been thinking about a lot and I wonder we haven't talked about is how much of this, the, 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 the way we define the disease susceptibility is actually biased by the difference in risk factor. So I'll take the case of coronary artery disease, for example, which is the one I know the most. It's that the way we run GWAS is just a case is a CAD, however we define that, based off of atherosclerosis or whatever in, 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 in ACD code and whatever definition of CAD we have, but the control is non-CAD. But the reality is that if you look at all of these data, Type 2 diabetes is a very important risk factor for CAD. And if someone is not classified as a CAD today, maybe that person already has some, some form of atherosclerosis related things that don't really classify that individual as a control, but that's what we do. And I wonder how much of that is hindering the work that we're doing and how much of that actually is related to 
really taking the effect estimate that we have in the SNP into straight um, uh, understanding and depth of the biology. So I'm I'm just not 100% sure I understood the question. So you're you're talking about like how our classification into cases and controls affects the results of the GWAS? Yeah, it's not like an ascertainment issue. That is, if you ascertain things differently, you can define traits differently. Well, I wonder if there was an element of time wrapped up into the question. So there's a lot of modifiable risk factors um, that we need to consider alongside our inherited risk factors. We have, you know, kind of a nice privilege working in the genetics field where we don't have to consider time too much. Um, with the exception of mostly, you know, age and other covariates that we need to consider along with our um, our analyses and maybe the context in which people live related to um, related to time, but like with other exposures in people's lives and other, um, you know, risk factors that people are exposed to, like those you need to really consider time with regards to disease incidents and progression as opposed to just case control status. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes, and how much of that will actually hinder the the, the effect estimate that we see across and how much of that will vary across population because some of those risk factors have prevalence that are different across population. So how can we actually combine all of these information to maybe have a better overview of the genetic estimate that we want to see? Um, well, I, I think that both uh, Suhini and you raised a really important point, which is that a lot of the ways we define traits are a, have a big arbitrary component to them. And uh, also, uh, there's a lot of overlap when you look at uh, biobanks, uh, then in terms of if you try to reduce genetic correlation between the number of traits, then you kind of like go down from many hundreds too many uh, fewer ones. And I wonder if one um, uh, interesting direction to go now in GWAS, which I know several people have, have started going into, is to try to use uh, the fact that we have uh, genetic data in, and we have it on multiple traits in order to maybe try to define a more meaningful biological traits. In, in the way of um, maybe um, some types of a dimensional reduction in terms of the genetic correlation between various traits, but also maybe one might relate it, um, I'd say uh, being biased as an evolutionary biologist to uh, fitness components, because fitness is um, an objective uh, measure, at least one for biological importance of a trait. Um, and I don't know a lot about this field, but I think that specifically when it comes to, uh, say, psychiatric disorders, then the degree of uh, arbitrariness and definition is also a very big issue. Um, so I'm just throwing this out there. And uh, yeah, please jump in, anyone, anybody. So I have a question from the, the Q&A online. The question relates to what we know about mutational rate differences across the genome and how that variation and mutation rate um, can explain or not uh, variation in uh, how much each individual locus um, explains trait variation. So what's the distribution of trait variation across the, the genome and mutation rate differences? So there's a real rich history in sort of classical quantitative genetics of measuring the so-called mutational heritability. And it's easy to take an inbred line you break it up and you look for divergence between the lines to solve new mutations. And the, the, the surprisingly consistent result is the mutational variation seems to be about one one thousandth of the environmental variation per generation with, you know, obviously variation about that. But, but there's a lot of variation that is generated uh, by that. And so remember, we're not looking at sequence variation, we're looking at sequence variation times effect size. But this gets to the broader question, which really underlies a lot of these issues in architecture, and that's pleiotropy. Because you might ask, well, why is my specific trait under selection? Your trait may not be under selection, but it may have a uh, underlying allelic variation, which also have pleiotropic effects on traits that are under selection. And one thing we really don't have a good feel on is pleiotropy. 
I mean, in my pleiotropy, I don't mean, gee, it affects two traits. No, I mean pleiotropy, these are the 6,000 defined traits that this one mutation affects. And that's really the underpinning we have to have to, to get models about how evolution shapes architecture, is we really have to have a good understanding of pleiotropy. A classic basic question, if you have a large effect allele, it's generally assumed that, if it, that it has more pleiotropic effects and those pleiotropic effects are larger, but that's an assumption. As far as I know, there's, there's some data on it, but not a lot of data on that. Thinking about, you know, speaking about pleiotropy of, of really fitness rather than many of the traits we are talking about. Um, the so yeah, if you want to look at the evolution, that's a good point. If you want to look at the evolution, the concern, well, it's a two-step process. Uh, ply, so you have an effect X eye color. Eye color affects some other trait Y, and trait Y is under selection. So ultimately what shapes it is pleiotropy with fitness, but that gets a, that's a indirectly measured by a pleiotropy with other traits which affect fitness components. Um, specifically um, re with regards to the question that was about mutation, I think it's an excellent question because we do know that you know, everything being equal, if the mutation rate would be larger in a region, then, then it would contribute to more genetic variation. And we actually know a lot about the determinants of mutation today in the human genome. I am not completely sure, but I think it's actually easily accessible question if it hasn't been looked at systematically on whether there's a, um, a direct relationship between, uh, between uh, the mutation rates and in, in, in regions in the genome and, and, uh, how much uh, different loci contribute. I think that's a readily studyable question right now, but I, I don't know the answer of like how much does it affect things, but I think it's actually a low hanging fruit if anybody chooses to do so. Um, there seems to be a lot of other questions. I, I didn't look- I've who... got the microphone. <laughs> Uh, a question and comment about uh, pleiotropy, and I was wondering if the panel can answer whether it becomes more problematic, uh, the, the rarer the variants or the bigger effect. For example, if I interpret Michelle's talk properly, then if that if that um, myostatin mutation or one of those mutations had been first mapped as in its homozygous state, so like an embryo, uh, embryonic lethal or something, you would have called it is a gene that's an embryonic lethal, but in the heterozygous state, it was a double muscling gene. In humans, we have all these Mendelian syndromes that are called after the person usually who first described them, but they often also have pleiotropic effects on height or growth or something, but we don't call them high genes, right? So, so we're missing something there when, we, when we're being very trait specific. And the so second one is a, is, a, is a comment or something to think about. I don't know which word comes beyond omni, but um, the late Bill Hill's model sort of uh, for complex trait was all mutations affect all traits. The question is by how much? Yeah, I like that model. That sounds right to me. Yeah, it's like really zero is like a very magic number, right? So it's like really hard to have zero effect. Um, yeah, I guess I don't really know what the problem of pleiotropy is. Like, um, especially I guess you mentioned mental disorders, right? Like I think, um, like uh, you, you, we, I don't think we know how to define mental disorders very well. I think that's fair to say. Um, and so to me, that's more of like a strength than a weakness that you can sort of use the pleiotropy to actually try and answer clinical questions. Um, I'm not sure that applies as much to other disorders, right? But I, I think that the, um, I think the move is to throw in all of the traits to all of the analyses and try and find parsimony in a like latent space or in a mixture of latent spaces or something like this. Um, I feel like once you get the mechanism, right, like once you have whatever this magic gene is that's doing the double muscling, like you don't, like, you know, it's going to increase height, you know what it's going to do, because you actually understand the biology, right? Um. I, I think maybe with regards to Peter's comment, uh, you know, yeah, zero is a magic number, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, just saying that every variant is uh, affects everything to a certain degree um, is uh, kind of like throwing the baby with the bathwater a little bit. So actually, when we're looking at a, you know a specific trait, and you know, there's a beautiful paper, for example, from NASA where he actually looked at a, 
at uh, complex trades where we actually for buyer markers where we know a lot about uh, about the uh, underlying pathways and then you could ask whether uh, how much of heritable variance that we identify in GWAS comes from the things that we know to be the underlying pathways and you discover that even in these cases which are maybe on the lower polygenicity range of of complex traits, then they explain uh, things that are directly relatable to these pathways explain and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, maybe 15% of the of the of the heritable variance in the trait. So actually, it's a um, perhaps quite surprising that we find a lot of the heritable variance uh, elsewhere. And, uh, you know, I want to add another comment on that. It's often, uh, um, you know, there's this um, notion that uh, I think it was even mentioned here that the uh, Fisher's infinitesimal model has found to be correct. Now, strictly speaking, that cannot be true, apropos uh, M0 being, an, you know, a special number because infinitesimal effects do not ag exist and the genome is not infinite. Um, Otherwise, we'd be in real trouble as doing uh, GWAS. Um, and, you know, I think there's this uh, mistaken impression that even though quantitative geneticists have been assuming that model for very long, they actually knew it to be true or a good approximation. Because actually, as far as I can tell, and maybe I'm risking myself here, but do uh, educate me, the evidence for assuming that the number of variants contributing to heritable variation in, in traits, rather than just assuming it is huge, has been very limited, right? Like, as far as I know, there's these uh, experiment director, direct, you know, the experimental evolution and looking at the response to direct selection and analyses by Bill Hill and others, where you could tell that maybe it's north of 20 variants that are contributing to the selective response, maybe north to 50 as best, but there's no way to distinguish 50 and 50,000. Now, after uh, GWAS, we know that we're living in the 50,000 world and, and beyond for some traits, a bit below for the other. So I, I think we should be a bit more careful with saying we knew this all along and it's all an infinitesimal model. Yeah, just two really quick comments on that. Um, uh, the infinitesimal model is wrong because what we what we see in the GWAS is small effects across the board, uh, but those effects are measured as variant sizes. So you have large effect alleles that are very rare. So you get this pattern of of small effect infinitesimal, but the effect is the variance. Whereas large effect alleles are out there; they're just rare. The other thing is that zero is a magic number, but so is four in ES. If the effective population size is relative to S, is such that it's not bigger than one, then those if those alleles are neutral. So they're basically just bouncing around there. Sweeney, do you want to weigh in? Because it's hard being the way. No, thanks. I do agree that four NES is a magic number. Oh, maybe that's what I have to do. Um, the to me the most shocking thing about all the studies about genetic architecture is how big the mutation target size is for for you know lots of traits it's 10 to the 7 base pairs or bigger so that's telling us for more or less any complex trait you think about there are 10 million sites in the genome where you can perturb that trait um, that that's you know surprising. Does pe do people have an explanation for that? And what does it tell us about the biology? It it tells us that there there really are lots of different ways in which you could affect more or less any trait you think of. Um, yeah, I I think for some traits there is a lot of variation in that though. Like you know, for body mass index, you get like the numbers you're you're talking about. But when you look at the uh, biomarkers, you actually get something that's like an an order and a half of magnitude lower. So it's not that uh, all variants are affecting everything, you know, other than 
the fact that zero is a magic number, which keeps coming back. Um, but I think the question of uh, what determines uh, um, the target size is actually uh, a, a very interesting one, even though, you know, you could say things about the traits themselves. You could hand wave and say, okay, body mass index is something that, you know, involves a lot of tissues and a lot of stages and developments and so on and so forth. And it kind of makes sense that it has a very a larger target size than uh, urate levels, for example. But uh, being able to move um, beyond that and say something systematic about the relationship between the kind of trait and the target sizes that we're identifying, I think, is a very interesting question and might involve things like uh, Bruce mentioned before, like, you know, maybe how modular the, the, the genetic system that's affecting it is or, or a buffering and, and questions like that as well. But, but just let me reinforce how extraordinary this is. Ten thousand sites affecting body mass index. Even if every twenty, every one of the twenty thousand genes had an effect, it would take five hundred sites in each of those genes. So we're postulating that. Every gene in the body affects body mass index, and in every gene, there's 500 sites where you could have that effect. That, that to me, is a, a very surprising conclusion. Regulation is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so you th my view on it is a lot of the variation you see, which is probably incredibly tiny, we just pick it up in these massively powered GWASs, is suppose you have a small RNA that binds something that regulates, which regulates your gene. Now you have a random DNA sequence that has a one base pair change. And now at some very low frequency, it can take some of that small RNA and bind it by mistake. That changes the stoichiometry slightly, not a big effect, but you have lots of potential for that scattered throughout the genome. That's kind of my view. It's probably dead wrong, but. I, I would also like to just add that the like BMI variant associations are maybe not all biologically similarly interesting or useful. So we can look at BMI associations with type 2 diabetes, look across populations, and some of those are going to line up in opposite effects compared to like consistent effects. And so where we're finding opposite effects, there's probably some interesting biology to be um, worked out there. Whereas like if you're looking at the most minuscule effect, that's like the most genome wide significant, or like just, you know, over your threshold where you have no idea what's going on. Maybe that's not where you would start to try to understand biology. So, you know, I like this idea of um, using pleiotropy to like also try to understand where biology is pointing us into consistent and different directions um, and using that to kind of like try to bear down into biology and pathways. But, uh, and so <clears throat> pleiotropy, but also selection. So I was really taken aback at some of uh, Michelle's findings that, you know, for, for these, I identified quantitative traits, so not even most of them measured, just eyeballed. And, but still, but, you know, for these size traits, you know, a substantial fraction of these looked like they were consequences of balancing selection or, you know, some pretty interesting selection effects. And I, so I think there's, potentially interesting parallels back to the biomarker space. A lot of us actually do have big effects across some populations that reflect important action of selection. I mean, you know, Duffy blood group polymorphisms and white cell counts and G6PD effects on things like hemoglobin A1C. Maybe we maybe we ought to be a lot more thoughtful about trying to hone in on more variation that that has clearly been seen by it. For, for grabbing hold of more of really important biology that we can hang. In one quick comment, but uh, I think we need to uh, finish fairly soon, but maybe we'll take another 
question. So I, I think in that regard, I, I agree with you. And I think, uh, you know, this was pointed out by many people like Aravinda, for example, and, uh, and uh, other people in the context of uh, looking at rare variants. So even though we know a lot about common variant architecture now, then, uh, then because of imputation limits and, and, and various other technical issues, then we're actually missing a lot of what's happening in the rare variants. And, you know, those rare variants may be much closer to the biology that's specific for the trait and, and might tell us a lot uh, about that. Just, um, um, uh, yeah, Loi can go here. I just want to make a comment on um, the, the biological interpretation. I was wondering whether uh, what you said, Guy, earlier, admitting that all genes or all variants affect all traits wasn't really uh, sort of plausible uh, for some you know, physical constraints on the genome, et cetera. But I, I was wondering whether that, that was actually a missed opportunity because if what, what if this, true, this is true? Uh, I was wondering whether the, the, we are being constrained by our ability to run biological experiments. You know, and, and that will change in you know, 100 years or 200 years. And, and I was wondering, what, what if this is true? Shouldn't we be thinking about how to expand our ways to run those biological experiments under a model where everything affects everything else? But the question is how much and how can we know, just thinking, for example, about this uh, CRISPR per perturbation experiments when you sort of, you can multi alter multiple sites at the same time. And maybe that will help us better understanding the, you know, linking what we learn from characterizing the architecture and, and have some biological um, sort of endpoint. So comment slash over to you. So, yeah, I don't think in an effective way that everything affects everything. Like, you know, um, you know, maybe in a minuscule amount that we, I don't know whether we'll, what we'll be able to measure in 200 years or whether we'll even be here. I mean, as the humankind, but uh, um, um, and, and I think that when you get to, you know, in infinitesimal effects, if we return to something else, it also becomes less biologically uh, interesting. I think we are seeing uh, clear differences in, um, in polygenicity and estimates of target size between traits where you, if polygenicity for biomarkers um, you know, start, you know, is around the 10,000 range and, and you, know, you move up and for height, uh, it's maybe you know, a bit north of 100,000. And when you go to target sizes, you have things like body mass index, which are really like, seem like more than half of what we estimate to be the functional human genome. But then we have things with target size that are much lower. So I, I think that thinking of everything as affecting everything in an effective way is not what we're seeing, but also I'm pretty happy that's the case because that would be a pretty difficult world to, to work in. People at the top of the distribution who have, you know, hundred or a thousand of those tiny effects, but you know, it can happen by chance that, you know, just like we with the Mendelian traits. So for those people, it matters and, and they will have an, a big phenotype nonetheless. But... I think just for the purpose of people getting coffee and so on, we might uh, continue this in coffee because I already exceeded the time that was allotted to us. So we'll have a quick 10 minute break and then come back at 3.40 for the round table discussion. <laughs> 